the new kingdom is also the age of the great personalities, the people that you might have heard of, the, pharaoh, the great pharaohs that you might know actually by name. Among these is a female pharaoh. At one point there was a woman who stepped up and became pharaoh. Her name is Hatshepsut. She is quite famous when you're looking through all the list of pharaohs to see a woman pharaoh. And her story is fascinating also. The story is that uh, around 1500 BC she was a princess and then she had a stepbrother who uh, was supposed to be um, king or stepson. A stepson who was supposed to be uh, the pharaoh and she basically imprisoned him and ruled in his stead. Had Shepsut, uh, you see here pictures of her, um, obviously a beautiful woman. Um, she, some of the pictures are quite interesting though. Uh, she ruled for 22 years. There are several pictures of her wearing a fake beard or appearing as a man. Um, this shows us that uh, maybe either in public that uh, she needed to present herself as a man or public images of her would be more receptive as a man. Um, other books refer to his, her as being very uh, ambitious. I always find that interesting that uh, she's a female pharaoh, so she must have been ambitious. Uh, that goes without saying. Uh, <laughs> to, to do what she did, yeah. For a man, they would have just said uh, she was very assertive. For a woman, she was ambitious to, uh, to try to claim this, this crown. Um, it's often shown as a man. Really quite interesting. Um, descriptions of her is that she was very beautiful and yet few Im images remain. She ruled for 22 years and apparently it was a really good 22 year period and the reason why few images of her remain, there aren't many left, um, if you see one in the museum it's a very rare item, is that when the, the man that she had imprisoned or had replaced on the throne when he finally steps up and asserts himself, um, she, her images are destroyed. We have found some with her name scratched off or others with her face uh, de defaced so it's uh, apparently either uh, people might have liked her there but once she was gone they tried to remove her there's a couple of other images of her Queen Hatshepsut another one is uh, Amenhotep IV this is just fascinating um, about 100 years 150 years after Hatshepsut uh, Amenhotep IV he uh, besides being very fascinating look at the way that he looks you can spot him in a second when you go in a museum uh, most of the pharaohs, 99% of the pharaohs, are just a standard image. And yet his face is elongated and his eyes are much more slanted. His uh, larger lips and larger nose, a very interesting look. And I'll show you another picture of his body. His body is very different looking also. You can spot him in a second. He is the most recognizable of the pharaohs. His story is that he presented a new god. At some point in his life he began to believe in a new god, a single god. His name is Amon the hidden one, the unseen God. And uh, Amon um, had uh, united with Ra. Actually, this is the other God. This is the, the new God at the time that the priests were worshiping. This is Amon, the hidden one, a unification of Amon and Ra. It's this Pharaoh Amenhotep IV who begins to worship a different God than that. He begins to worship this one God, Aton or Atin, uh, as a sun disk, when you see pictures of Amenhotep, you can see a sun disk. Now they had the sun as Ra, but this is a different image of the sun. It's, it, it's recognizably different. It is a disk. It is a three-dimensional disk. This is monotheism. He will say that there is one God, this disk in the sky, and that's it. Monotheism, a one-time brush with monotheism for the Egyptians. Here's a picture of him and his wife. We know his wife's name, Nefertiti. And uh, their children. You can see a couple of children. One, two, three children in the picture. That's unusual. You don't see, usually see pharaohs with their children. And you can, in the top you can see the disc. It's a sun, but it's a three-dimensional sun disc up there. Amenhotep changed his name. He changed his name from Amenhotep to Aken Aton. It is good with Aton. I like Aton. I support Aton, this sun disc. And we think there's a civil war how much actual fighting, we're not sure, but it's definitely a civil disc, d discord <laughs> going on in uh, Egypt between the priests who are having this other god, Aton, um, Aten, Amon, with uh, this new god, Aton. And uh, in fact, the, uh, the Pharaoh will actually move out of Thebes and create his own new capital city, Amara. A new capital city 
in the desert. We found it recently and uh, been able to excavate it. And it's quite fascinating, this one-time strange brush with monotheism. So how much of a civil war, we're not really sure, but it's definitely caused disruption, especially when you're trying to run an empire. Again, this is an age of empire when you're conquering people. And uh, this isn't good when you're fighting back home. Again, here's a picture of his wife. We know that his wife supported him. Her name's Nefertiti. Um, this is a bust of her, the famous bust of Nefertiti that is found. It's now in Berlin. And uh, we know he has a son. I don't know if it's Nefertiti's son, but it's one of his sons. He probably had many wives. And uh, the son's name is Tutankhamun. Perhaps you've heard of him. This is King Tut. So there's the famous bust of Nefertiti, the beautiful wife of this strange-looking pharaoh, Amenhotep. There he is with his strange-looking face. And there's that picture again of him and his wife with their strange-looking children, with their oblong back of the head. And then there's another picture of his children with their strange head. Um, you can do this to a child. We think that this isn't exaggerated, that they took the back of their children's head and made it into a bulb shape like that. The very strange things uh, in the museums when you pass by Amenhotep. And then he died. And with him, his God passed on. Um, and they will make the next Pharaoh his son. His young son, Tutankhamun, uh, just a young man. And as you see the dates here, after Amenhotep IV, you see Tutankhamun from 1347 to 1338. That's about nine years. He doesn't last that long. He'll be dead as a teenager. This is the famous King Tut. Didn't really accomplish much. Didn't have a chance to accomplish much. Um, but the most famous thing about him is we found him. He is the lone pharaoh that has been found intact in his tomb. We have other pharaoh bodies that we found in a corner somewhere of their tomb because nobody wanted the pharaoh's body. But this is the single tomb that was discovered intact in the Valley of the Kings, 1922, the discovery of King Tut's tomb. It, uh, in the Valley of the Kings, it had been put into a, carved into the side of a wall, and another one carved above it, and the debris from this one covered his tomb better. So it was very much more harder to get to, so it stayed intact for much longer, wasn't robbed. And uh, once we opened this tomb, you could see the Book of the Dead, all the drawings and beautiful drawings and lots of gold for a king who didn't do much. So you can imagine what a powerful king would have had in his burial. Uh, we have a sarcophagus. They used to say that that's not really what he looked like, that that's just a standard picture. And then we've got his body. We found, this is a little doll we found in his tomb. And then we have his bones and everything. And they did a reconstruction. And he basically looks like the doll and like the... Uh, the sarcophagus, so maybe they do look like that. But it's interesting to see what a young Egyptian pharaoh would have looked like. And he had dolls of himself even. So the next uh, pharaoh that uh, comes up is a great personality, Ramses II. So we've moved down to the 1200 BCs now. And if you look at him, he's going to have a long rule from 1279 to 1213. That's a, that's a long rule, over 60 years there. Now he'll be around for quite a while. This is the last of the great pharaohs also. This, his rule will be a, one of greatness at the very end of this new kingdom. And this, this new kingdom rules for 67 years. He'll rule to be an old man. He's most famous for waging wars against the Hittites. There is another empire out there. The Hittites, present-day Turkey, present-day Asia Minor. The Hittites had a rival kingdom. And they will fight wars about halfway between. Egypt, if you move halfway toward Asia Minor and come down from Asia Minor, you're going to find out where they waged war. And it's basically in present-day Syria, Lebanon, that area. So it's great wars against the Hittites, recorded not only by the Egyptians, but also by the Hittites. We have their records of the wars too. So fought in Palestine, present-day Palestine or Israel. Uh, the most famous, the battle that uh, Ramses speaks of over and over in his, in his recorded of his life is the Battle of Kadesh. This great chariot battle a great army of Egyptian chariots versus an army of uh, Hittite chariots and descriptions of it. V vivid descriptions, pictures of it. Here's pictures and descriptions. There's a river. There was a river nearby. Here's the, uh, the, the, the chariots. You've got the Pharaoh himself on the battlefield. And we have a great description of it. In fact, uh, it actually doesn't... It's not, it's not complete propaganda that they actually talk about the Egyptians making bad moves and getting attacked on their flank. Um, but according to the Egyptian accounts, they win the Battle of Kadesh. 
And then according to the Hittite records, which we also have, uh, they won the battle. So uh, the general view is that they probably fought to a draw. Fought several battles and fought to a draw. In fact, we actually have a treaty. We actually have the recorded treaty. And that's pretty much what it establishes, a DMZ, a demilitarized zone uh, in present-day Syria, basically around the Battle of Kadesh. In other words, this will just be a, a neutral zone. Ramses II, we actually have his body found, and this is him, um, mummified with red hair. That's quite interesting. A uh, Maybe an outsider. Maybe somebody came in and brought new genes, and he has a red hair. You don't see that among the Egyptians. We know he had hundreds of wives. This probably wasn't unusual, but he lives a long time, 67 years of rule, and he has hundreds of wives and then hundreds of sons and daughters. And he lives so long that he will end up marrying some of his daughters. Again, the incest, um, the gods were doing it, and the Egyptians will be doing it, keeping the family line nice and tidy. And then the most fascinating aspect from a religious point of view is this the Pharaoh the Hebrew Torah mentions in the book of Exodus Pharaoh that's all it says is Pharaoh that the Hebrew people will be leaving Egypt defying Pharaoh so is this him is it the one before him or the one after him we're not really sure but it could be him that we have found the Ramses of the Pharaoh of the Exodus and again the story matches up there's the chariot army that uh Moses will have to fight against. So there is evidence, some evidence, circumstantial evidence, maybe. But it is impressive if the, if the Hebrews escaped at this time that this was a, a Egypt, a powerful Egypt with powerful armies. Uh, another aspect of Ramses is his temple at Abu Simbel. He built lots of temples, but this is quite fascinating. A temple with giant statues of himself out front. And we remember Abu Simbel because when the Egyptians finally get their independence, um, they will want to dam the Nile so they can control the flooding, which makes sense. But they put the, the dam at a place called Aswan. And when you dam a river, you're going to have a lake behind it. And this would have been underwater, except that the international community stepped in and had this basically cut off the side of a mountain and moved away so that it wouldn't be underwater. So we come to the fall of the new kingdom. Um, after Ramses, this great, powerful pharaoh that he describes himself as, things seem to just deteriorate. Starting at about the year 1200, just after the great Ramses, things start to decline. There are reports of sea people. Somebody is invading. There's people landing from the Mediterranean Sea in the Nile Delta, and they can't stop them. These sea people coming in with uh, better weapons. Also, invasions from the Fertile Crescent, not just the Hittites anymore, but all kinds of people invading from the Fertile Crescent. And then by the year 1000, we, the record just stops. There's a, just a collapse of Egypt. Everything comes to an end. Um, they become subjugated. Basically, they don't have a line of pharaohs. They're just at the mercy of whoever invades them. And uh, just want to mention here, we will get to one of the great invaders in the year 674 BC, the invasion of the Assyrians. This will leave a mark. These Assyrians will come back to them, um, conquered all of Mesopotamia, all of the Fertile Crescent, all of Egypt. They are the great, uh, powerful empire of this ancient world. I will refer to them later as the ancient Nazis when we come back and talk about them. But the decline of Egypt is kind of sad. Their greatness just doesn't disappear. It just is left standing in the desert with hieroglyphs that no one could read after a while. And just to finish up here, this isn't on the test, but I just want to show you the, the sad history of Egypt that um, foreign invaders come in, the, the Assyrians most notably, and then the list goes on and on. They're just constantly invaded by somebody, the Libyans, the Nubians, the Persians, the Macedonians. Alexander the Great will come in here, and then the Romans will uh, rule and uh, use Cleopatra and then just rule in her stead. Uh, the Arabs eventually will come in after Mohammed. And then the Ottoman Turks will come in in the 1300s. And then the Mamelukes, all the way to the 1700s, when Napoleon invades, he will be driving off the Mamelukes. And then uh, the French will give way to the British, who will hold it for till World War II. So it's kind of a sad end of Egypt. But they do finally get their independence.